just the way it looks on here, it oh. doesn't actually show that way. That's my understanding. Yeah, we need to have that number. Uh, Welcome to the conference server. You are now entering the conference. There are five more participants in the conference. What did you say? Hello, everyone. This is the district office. Hi. Hi. Hey, Tina, thanks for going in to get this all set up. <coughs> oh, sure. And I don't know, um, Cheryl Sanderson has to jump off at 1030 um, because Tim Hill from the Department of Education is meeting with business managers to get some input from them on some of these holdbacks. So I really feel like that's important for her to be part of that conversation. Okay. Um, okay. And, and that just came out, I believe, yes, either Friday or yesterday. Okay, so we'll continue on or we'll need to convene or? Um, well, I just want to make you aware. If we're just, I thought you said we were just setting norms today. Is that right? Oh, w yeah, setting norms. And also, I was going to go through some language in the negotiated agreement. Okay, um, just cleaning up some language. Okay, I think, it, I mean, it should be fine. Okay. Unless you just want to set the norms and then set another meeting. I, it, it's one of those, it's a balancing act because she needs to be part of those conversations so that we can have some input on these holdbacks and how they can or cannot be used. Sure, absolutely. We have to have a second meeting for the financial stuff anyways. So I think if we go ahead and do the language and stuff, none of it will get ratified or approved until the whole document's done together. Is that correct? Yeah, as as you mentioned, Alicia, and thank you for clar clarifying that at the school board meeting, we absolutely cannot discuss any compensation uh, at this time because we, we don't know, you don't know, we don't know where we're at. So, um, yeah, definitely we'll have to meet um, again to, uh, and we discuss after uh, May 19th. So I think if that's the case, since we're still planning on that, that I'm comfortable going, going ahead um, and Cheryl can review after this meeting or when she comes back what we discuss. And then if there's more concern at that second meeting, we can revisit it. But I think it would, unless I think if everyone's okay and that shows good faith on all parties, we'll still be okay to do language. Okay. But that, I mean, if everyone agrees with that. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Well, and this is Cheryl. I can, I'll jump back in as soon as that State Department call is done. So maybe it won't last very long. Okay, so are all, all parties are here, correct? 
Yeah, from our okay. side, we have Alicia, Cheryl, and Sharon, so we're here. Okay, and for negotiators, myself, Shannon Forrester, Cheryl Keithley, and Glenn Kershaw. And I am the representative for the elementary level. Glenn is for the middle school, and Cheryl is for the high school. And we would just like to um, uh, maybe discuss how you want to first, if, uh, do you want us to all mute as one person speaks, or how do you generally uh, run it through this program or through the phone like this? It typically helps if people mute just to keep the background noise down. Um, and then just unmute when you're ready to speak. And we will talk over each other, but we'll we'll figure out a pattern. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and um, is there anything else we need to know about the teleconference? Just basically, um, when we are done, we just hang up. There's, um, or if what if we want to. Um, like if we stop for just a few moments, um, can we pause or it's just, it remains on and we'd all have to call back. So it, we need to leave the system on because if you stop it, then you have to generate a new link to get it going again. Okay. Um, and so, uh, Gina can mute from, from that side if we need to. And then if we mute our phones, you, you can't hear, obviously, either, so. Okay. All right. But you, well, but I, you can also, uh -huh. if, some of, if some of us stay on and you guys need to get off and call each other, you can call back in to the same number. Does that make sense? Oh, okay, sure. As long as somebody remains on the line, we can always call back in. Yeah, and use the same number. Because sometimes, okay. I know last board meeting, there were a couple people that had issues and would get kicked off and have to dial back in. So, yeah, just keep this number handy and just dial back in. Okay. Okay. All righty. Um, so, is there any norms um, that we want to set as far as um, with this teleconference? It's quite difficult, but... Um, any norms that we want to set um, regarding um, the the use of the teleconference or um, anything? Does anybody have any concerns besides what I've brought up so far? No, I think I think the best thing to know is just understand that we probably will talk over each other and be understanding. Um, cause sometimes there can be a delay, so we just need to pay attention to that. So, okay, <clears throat> great. All right. Well, I just wanted to start out today. Uh, the three of us, uh, negotiators wanted to give a little bit of background about who we are and, um, you know, what we've been, you know, how long we've been in the district. So I'll go ahead and start. Uh, again, I'm Shannon Forrester, and I'm the PE teacher at Purple Sage. I have been in the Middleton School District for 18 years. I started teaching third grade at the Heights, and then I moved to Purple Sage when they opened. Uh, Middleton was actually, this is the third district I've been in. I came from West Beta. Um, at that time, it was Meridian. I actually graduated from Meridian High School way back in the day. And um, so I still call it Meridian sometimes instead of West Data. Uh, I taught seven or fourth grade for seven years at Purple Sage, and then I got my PE endorsement. And I've been the PE teacher there for the past 10 years. I absolutely love my job and my students. And I'm sure if you ask any of them, they would tell you, yes, Mrs. Forrester loves us. They're pretty sure of that. And um, I'm also the PDIS lead at Purple Sage, which means I'm directly involved with creating a positive environment for students and staff, <clears throat> excuse me, where both can feel safe and respected. Uh, my children graduated from Middleton. 
and we have been community members for the past 20 years. And my husband is also a public servant. He is a firefighter. And the reason why I decided to become a negotiator for MEA is definitely because, not because, not because of the pay. <laughs> um, and I actually think I might be able to buy a new pair of tennis shoes after negotiations, but I'm not really sure about that. But, um, or if stores will be even open for me to buy a new pair of tennis shoes. But, um, however, I believe so much in public education and its importance to the foundation of our country that I willingly accepted this position. And um, I also want to make sure teachers have what they need to educate their students because a teacher's work environment is a student's learning environment. So when teachers have what they need, they can best educate their students. And um, to me, that is what is most important. And I know we talked about it earlier. We all are on the same page. We all want what is best for our students. And we want to be able to educate them the best we can. So that's, um, that's what I'm about. Um, Glenn? OK, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, my name is Glenn Kershaw. Um, I've been a Middleton resident ever since I've been married. Um, my wife and I have had five kids. Um, all of them attended uh, Middleton schools. Three of them have graduated from Middleton, and two are still attending. Um, I have a farm, 25 acres. Uh, my brother and I split recently my parents' farm with 100 acres, and, and uh, I run 25 acres of it. I run some beef cattle, and uh, I work for some, a farmer in the summertime. Um, also, um, so I am very vested property owner in the Middleton School District, and um, I have taught in the Middleton School District for um, uh, 15 years. I taught at Mill Creek at first for about eight years, and then I've been at the Middle School School for seven. I taught uh, at Caldwell for 12 years before that. So I've been in education a, lot, a, a while, and I see the benefits of the public education with my children and um, with uh, me being a teacher. Um, uh, it's opened my eyes to education and how important it is for um, children to learn and become educated. Um, I've enjoyed teaching. I'm currently teaching seventh grade math, and, and I love it. Um, I had an opportunity to teach math full time and, and I took it. I really enjoyed teaching middle school math. Um, it's, it's an amazing place to be and a wonderful place to work. And um, I really want to keep that up. That's why I became a negotiator when they asked me to become one. And I want to keep the education um, system going well and doing good. Thank you. I guess it's Cheryl's turn. Hi, Cheryl Keithley. I'm the current college and career advisor. Prior to that, I taught English and speech for over 20 years, all at Middleton High School. I also taught every elective that was needed to fill course loads for students, so advisory and creative writing and reading. I had a little bit of everything. Middleton just isn't my job. It's my home, my history, my family, my friends, my neighbors, my memories. And to explain that, I have to go back to 1956, which is when my dad graduated from Middleton High School. And for a short time, life and work took him away from Middleton, but he eventually moved our family here when I was in the third grade. So I've been in Middleton since 1982. <laughs> and he was incredibly proud when my sister and I both graduated from Middleton High School. I started teaching at Middleton High School in 1997, and each fall when I introduce myself to classes, I tell students about my experiences as a track athlete, a band member, a newspaper editor, library aide, National Honor Society member, all those kind of things in the Middleton School. I get to tell students that my oldest son graduated from Middleton, and my youngest son will soon graduate from Middleton. I get to help those current Middleton students be proud Vikings, and that's something that's so important to me. 
I know what Middleton's meant to my family, and I value the opportunity to continue to make our school safe and welcoming for all of our students. So that's part of why I wanted to be a negotiator. Each day I know I have an obligation to my friends, my neighbors, my community to provide a quality education for their children, just like I expected for my own, just like my dad expected for his girls. And I know that all of us working together, we can make that happen for our students. Great, thank you, Cheryl and Glenn. Um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Reberry or um, Tuggy or Cheryl, if you would like to any background. Sure, I can just uh, quickly give give my background. Uh, I started as a teacher oh, 27 years ago. Um, it doesn't seem like it's been that long, but it, but it has been. <laughs> um, and I've been a classroom teacher. I taught fourth grade. I was also a Title I teacher. Um, then I have worked also at the collegiate level as well as the state level. Um, I have also been a principal, um, assistant superintendent, and then uh, when I worked for Idaho Digital Learning Academy, I was their director of education programs. So I've had, I've had many different hats in the facet of the education world, as well as being a parent. So, Alicia? Sure, I um, actually grew up over the hill in Emmett. So I'm familiar with small town and we played Middleton for high school sports. and. Um, I had friends from over here. I have four kids that all attend the Middleton School District in every elementary, middle school, and high school. And we have been so impressed and we love the teachers. Um, I have a business, a bachelor's degree of business administration. And um, I am lucky enough to be able to stay home and run things in this crazy household of mine. But um, I just really... I ran for the school board because initially I had some concerns and <clears throat> issues with the curriculum, which led to a whole eye-opening opportunity to a lot of learning, a lot of seeking to understand about everything from financial to law to making friends to um, understanding how the public school system works and how involved and how it's a, almost just a living, breathing thing and how many people work so hard to get it to function as well as it does and how much um, they go above and beyond to make it great for our kids. And so I appreciate the opportunity to be able to be part of negotiations. I've learned a lot from the last two years and um, I love to just help be part of that process to balance between helping the teachers get what they need and they want and also supporting the district and the taxpayers on the financial side and um, sometimes logistical side and just watching how we can work together to make things great for all of the kids. Okay, I guess my turn. I, um, I have ties to Middleton in the way that my, my mother graduated from Middleton Hyatt in 1957. So my background is um, started in accounting and IT and project management. I joined the McCall Donnelly School District as their business manager in 2011. I was there for almost six years. Um, needed to come back to the Valley to be near closer to my aging parents and joined the Caldwell School District as the business manager under the chief financial officer. I was there about three years, almost three years. And so I've been um, with Middleton here since about the 1st of July last summer. So um, very excited to be here, um, have strong ties to the community. My girls actually grew up in Star. Um, we were part of Eagle or West Ada now. So, but um, I'm excited to be at Middleton. Great, thank you. And I think it's so important for us to just share our background and where we come from so that we can understand each other more. And um, it just makes it 
nice to know who you're talking to, even though we can't see you. It it is nice to know who uh, we are talking to. Um, I just wanted to read uh, quickly again, just the good faith part of our negotiated agreement at the top, where it says negotiation procedure on page five. Uh, good faith. Both parties agree to meet at reasonable times and places and to negotiate in a good faith effort to reach agreement. Negotiations in good faith shall include but not limited to the goal of reaching agreement by the end of the current contract year. Minutes shall be kept and made available upon request. And on our side, we are having Cheryl take notes and um, I'm is Cheryl also taking notes on your side as well? I mean, not my, our Cheryl, your Cheryl. <laughs> um, I can take notes on our side. Okay. And if you want um, to just call me Keithley for this to make it easy because of the two Cheryls, I'm fine with that. Okay, Keithley, we'll do that. <laughs> might make it a little easy. That's what I'm going to do in the notes is just use last name. Casey, okay. And also, Dr. Ribery, if um, if you don't, you know, if your side doesn't want to take notes, um, we can share the notes with you. That's no problem. We did that last year. So it's okay. up to you. Maybe we, can, maybe we can do that. We can compare notes together. Cheryl and I, Casey, okay. and I can work on sharing notes together to make sure we didn't miss something. Okay. And then Perfect. we'll just have one set. So thank you. Okay. Uh, and then also, I wanted to read uh, Good Faith, uh, the definition in Idaho Code 331272. Um, good faith means honesty, fairness, and lawfulness of purpose with the absence of any intent to defraud, act maliciously, or take unfair advantage, or the observance of reasonable standards of fair dealing. So um, just wanted to read that part. As we move forward, um, and basically, um, everybody has their negotiated agreement. I wanted, um, is there anything else before we begin that um, we need to discuss setting norms? Okay, I am hearing none. We'll move forward. Okay, so if we turn to page... 11 of our negotiated agreement. Um, on section B, where it says leadership pay, a committee to determine leadership positions pursuant to Idaho Code 33-1004J shall consist of teachers representing elementary, middle, and high school. And then one of which will be an MEA member administrators and stakeholders and shall be approved by the board. Administration will provide teachers written job descriptions and or expectations of additional assignments or duties required prior to acceptance. And um, looking at this, we wanted to, um, and according to Idaho code, we cannot uh, bargain or negotiate the funds and how they, um, how they are dispersed. However, we can um, discuss the parties involved in making up that committee. And in parentheses, where it says one of which will be an MEA member, this is regarding the um, representing elementary, middle, and high school. This is teachers. We would like, instead of one of which will be an MEA member, we would like to switch one to all of the teachers um, on that committee being uh, MEA members. And the reasoning for that is the MEA, our members are trained. Um, we receive training through the IEA and we um, have information about Idaho code, we have information regarding um, the different types of um, Idaho code and policies. We're trained on policy, and we feel that it would be best serve the committee if we had all MEA members 
um, the teachers representing this are all MEA members. Scott, can I get some clarification on just some background on this leadership committee? Like when it started, when they meet, because I'm not, I don't know, did this even happen this year? Did we have a leadership committee? In, in the past, oh, 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 go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is how the leadership stipends are determined, and it happens in the spring of each year for the following year. Um, so this was decided last spring so that they could set forth those leadership premiums or stipends, I believe. That is correct, Dr. Reberry, yes. And it has happened in the past. The leadership committee, the um, district leadership team, um, has been the one that um, decides in, within their committee, within their, within their team, um, the committee has decided how those funds will be dispersed or those um, leadership premiums and to whom um, they would go. So um, that is, that's how it's happened in the past. And, and the this next year, year and, oh, go ahead. No, you finish, Shannon. Okay, so in, um, this year, since we don't have school, I'm not really sure, um, you know, how, how or what that will look like um, going forward, but you're right, it is determined in the spring for the following year. Well, and all I was gonna mention is that the next DLP meeting is scheduled for mid-May, but uh, we're gonna have to figure out how that will look, so. I don't know who I am uh, with the wording to have it be all, that they all need to be a member of the MEA. Um, I get that they're trained, but I also feel like having one person that's trained in policy that can share with the other people, I don't think them not being a member, um, excluding them from the opportunity to sit on that committee, I don't, I just feel like that's pretty exclusive and it could exclude a lot of people who could um, be a good benefit and be a good, have good input on that committee. So I feel like saying they all need to be MEA members is a little exclusive. And this is Sean, I would agree with that because the DLP members are chosen by the building themselves. And so um, the teachers are all putting putting their, their vote and their faith in the teachers coming to DLT. So I would agree with Alicia on that. Um, okay. When, um, when we have, which the wording says, one of which will be an MEA member, we have, and correct me if I'm wrong, we have two from each building, right? Is that correct on the leadership team? Two yeah, teachers from each building? Two from each building, and I believe one of those two has to be an MEA member, I believe. I will need to double check on that for sure. Okay, well, that was the intent, was that one of them be, um, one of the two be an MEA member. Um, and we just, you know, are wanting to make sure, you know, if, if, if we can have a majority, you know, as our local represented in, in this, is what we're wanting. If you could, um, or if we can clean up the wording though, so it doesn't mean just one person is an MEA member, but we need to clarify one from each building or one from each grade level, I guess, is what the wording would be. So if I understand correctly, currently when this committee gets together, Mill Creek has two people, Purple Sage has two people, the high school has two people. Is that correct? And one is an MEA member and one doesn't have to be, but could be. Is that what I'm understanding? I, I, need, to, I need to check on that, Alicia. I, I'm, I believe, but I'm not 100%. So I, I just want to verify that. 
because I would be okay with that. But like, I agree with Shannon, if that's the case, it needs to be worded in here that there are two representatives because the first time Shannon read that, I didn't know that there was two from each building and it's not each grade level. It's just each building. Correct. Right. Okay. Or from each each grade level, middle, um, elementary, middle, and high. So the elementary doesn't have two from each building. They just have two people that represent all three elementary schools. Well, no, well, they, they have, have two, two from each building. building. Two from each building on DLT. I'm just not. I need to verify if one has to be an MEA member or not. That I'm not 100% on. Okay, so can we make a note and maybe if we take a break, um, Sharon, would you be able to verify that? Yeah. In like a few minutes or do you think you need like a lot of time to be able to verify that? No, I can make Basically, a phone call. Okay, so I'm saying if we keep working through this, Shannon, and um, okay. Glenn and sure. Lee, would it be okay to um, have her verify that and then come back and revisit that once she has that information? Okay, sure. Um, but I do know um, the language here, the intent was one um, from each building. And that's why we needed to clean up this language is that it, it doesn't, it's not specific enough. It doesn't say one from each building. It just says one, which will be an MEA member. So that does need to be cleaned up. So yeah, um, Dr. Reberry, go ahead and um, do what you need to do. That's fine. Um, and we can come back. Absolutely. And then two, maybe I could request if you guys, when we have our little break, could um, bring uh, wording or verbiage that you would like to see put in there to help clean it up. Okay. And then maybe we can do the same on our side and then we can compare. Okay, sure. And all I wanted would you know if if we couldn't do the all um at least then um one of which will be from each building would be an mea member something like that but yeah we'll go ahead and and get the specific verbiage for that sure or come up with that thanks mm -hmm. okay and then moving on to page 12. Um, on page 12, number four, retirement notice. Employees who have reached the rule of 90 and worked in the district five consecutive years are eligible for this $500 stipend. By February 1st, the employee must give the district a signed letter of intent to retire at the end of the current school year. The $500 will be paid to the employee after the board has accepted the retirement at an official board meeting. The employee would need to reapply for open positions and reimburse the district if they are hired in a certificated capacity. Um, what we would like is, and the intent of this language here, I know um, the district um, actually wanted, um, and Glenn, you can chime in on this because I believe you're the, you were uh, negotiating when this was first brought, um, but the district wanted a way to um, in incentivize teachers to tell them early if they were retiring because it is best for the district to be able to search for new employees. So they wanted to do that early. So um, that's where this language came from. Glenn, do you have anything to add about the language before I continue? Yeah, that's, that's the language. I know we changed the last part here recently, that last sentence or so, <laughs> but yeah. That was the intent. I agree with everything you said. Okay. okay, so what we would like to do is um, where it says retirement notice, employees who have reached the rule of 90, we would like to um, scratch that, reached the rule of 90, because 
we have teachers who are retiring before the rule of 90. And it makes sense to, you know, give them this as well, this um, stipend here as well, because our, the district needs to know in advance. So otherwise, this, the teachers do not have to let the district know until it, you know, way late in the game. Can you clarify? I don't know for sure what the rule of 90 is. Can you explain that to me? Sure, absolutely. So when teachers retire from Percy, and it's through our um, retirement system, our state retirement system, um, they have to reach the rule of 90. That means your years of service plus your age equal 90. And that's when you get your full retirement benefit. However, you can retire early um, before you reach the rule of 90. It's the only, the, the rule of 90 just is your, you'll receive your maximum benefits through Percy at your rule of 90. But you can retire okay. early. Yeah. And a lot of teachers choose to do so. Cheryl, financial Cheryl, do you know how many teachers we potentially have in this position who could potentially retire if that rule of 90 was lifted? Or maybe how many have in the past? I don't think, I think she jumped off for her meeting at 10.30. Oh, that's right, mm -hmm. 10.30. So we may have to come back to this one. Okay, is that information if, that we could get fairly quickly though? Because I think that would help me put a perspective. I mean, if it's like one or two teachers, Versus if it's like 20 teachers, I mean, just so we can understand what the potential impact financially would be for the district. Unless you know. Yeah, we can. You guys know, or Glenn? I don't know that number, but it would directly benefit the district to know who's retiring and who's not so that they can hire those uh, good teachers before August. But. Right, I agree. Yeah, and Alicia, we can get the numbers. I don't, I don't know how quickly we can do that, though. So I don't want to promise that we could get it in 20 minutes, and it need to take longer. So um, that's okay. something we'll have to ask Cheryl. I think, it's, for my personal opinion, as long as the rules, um, as long as the numbers are reasonable, I don't see why that would really matter to us. The rule of 90. I think, as long as financially the district could support that it would be in our best interest to be able to start our search early for teachers um so i think if shannon and if you guys are okay with us waiting until we can get a couple numbers we'll just put these notes down to we might have to reconvene like do our research and come back in 15 minutes and see if we can kind of finalize these but i think i would be okay with that okay um yeah, we'll give you, I mean, if you need, however, you know, much time you need on this is fine with us. We, we're just going to go through and, and, and we expected that, you know, you wouldn't be able to, you know, give us, um, you'd have to do your research as well. And, um, okay, and then, now this one's a big one. <laughs> and um, um, Trustee McConkey, you were last year. We worked so hard on this, and it was um, it was a lengthy, lengthy discussion. We came back to it several times, but it's number five on page twelve. And I'll go ahead and read it. If an employee is asked to substitute during his or her preparation period or absorbs another class, the teacher will receive one school lunch. In order to receive this compensation, the employee needs to follow the established procedure. And so um, I guess to give the background on this, um, First, I'm going to have Cheryl um, Keithley, because she is at the high school, just explain why um, and how um, teachers are subbing during their prep time. 
Um, Cheryl Keithley, are you on? I'm on. Okay, go ahead and can you explain to us what's happening at the high school? Yes. So, especially in the spring, so it's not going to happen this year because we're gone, but in the spring, almost daily, we would get emails saying, we need someone to cover so-and-so sixth and seventh class. We need someone to cover period one through five for so-and-so. So teachers may be calling in sick, definitely coaches leading in the afternoon, and there weren't enough subs to cover a whole day for like the teachers that called in sick or a way to have subs cover those afternoon classes. So it just reached the point that everybody was frustrated. The secretary's trying to find coverage for the class, teachers that were losing their prep time or having to absorb a class instead of having their class of, you know, 25 English students, they took somebody else's class in. So that's how I got introduced to MEA to ask for some compensation, something that would help resolve the issues that were going on. Thanks, Cheryl. And and so last year, we discussed how to compensate these teachers for giving up their prep period. And um, we ended up with one school lunch. And when we brought that back to our members and to the teachers, um, they weren't very happy about that. Um, nothing against the school lunch. They're really good school lunches. However, they just um, have made it known to us that they would like to be compensated fairly, and they do not feel that a school lunch is fair. So we are wanting to revisit this. Are there any Can comments? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Keith Lee again. Uh, a couple of the things that happened when that came out last year, and it wasn't, like Shannon said, it wasn't anything against school lunch. We have teachers that really don't have lunch. They're working through their lunch. They're also the same teachers willing to cover for somebody else's class because they're trying to make sure things happen for our kids. So it really wasn't even an option to compensate them that way. They don't have time to go down and stand in line and get their lunch and go back to their room and eat it. We also had administration say that it was, incredibly hard to keep track of this. How were they supposed to, you know, monitor all those? They didn't even know if teachers had followed through to get their lunch or not. So it really was a problem for both sides, not just teachers. Right. So admin are also having a hard time tracking and um, keeping the data on who receives a free lunch. Correct, Cheryl? Yes. Okay. So other districts um, either compensate with pay or with personal days. And we would like to propose um, a change that for each um, prep period that is, um, you know, that they substitute during his or her prep period or absorbs another class, um, the teacher will receive 0.2 of a personal day. So after five times of um, subbing, they would receive a personal day. Okay, so I have a couple questions. What do other districts do to track that? Like, how do you know that it's officially been covered? It was an official, they're out. So officially now this person is taking this class. Um, I haven't actually spoken to how that is tracked, but they must, you know, there's some sort of, um, and it's, I believe it's in the district is where it, it is taken care of. But what I foresee is if we had a, a district form where, you know, the teacher was responsible for filling it out and then the administrator could just um, check yes or no, this teacher did comply with 
you know, whatever procedure we have. And um, it would be kept at the district level. Because the other problem is when they accrue, I mean, I guess my question, Keith, Lee, maybe you can answer this is, how many days are we talking about? Because if this is happening, if the same teachers are doing it over and over, and in a week I could do it for five different teachers, that's, I could technically accrue one personal day a week if I'm giving up my prep every day. And then we have to find a sub for those personal days that they take, which we're already, that's the problem we're in, right, is finding coverage. So I, I guess walk me through kind of how you foresee this or how much it's being used. Can you give me reference on numbers and frequency? So I, and that would be my question too. I think Katie Anzalone had the numbers from last year because she kept track of all those emails that were coming out. I can't say that there were any teachers that had to do this every day, but there were definitely teachers that had to do this every week. So when your golf coaches are gone or track coaches are gone for fifth, sixth, seventh period, those same teachers that have prepped those periods were getting hit every week. So not every day, but maybe every Tuesday or every Thursday, they were getting hit to take these classes on. So over a course of five weeks, if they're doing one per week, that would be their personal day. It would take them five. Did, Shannon, did you guys have any other suggestions besides uh, personal comp or money for that? Or those are the only two things that they think would be fair for that service? That is what they discussed um, on our survey that we sent out about concerns. Um, the other, and if you look back on page 11, um, where it talks about other compensation, um, if you look, let's see, where is it for compensating teachers? Wait, maybe it's at the top of page. Yes, it is. Sorry. It's actually on the top of page 12 there. Um, we pay at the rate of $25 an hour for extra, um, for additional compensation. Um, so, um, you know, either compensating them with, you know, additional um, money or a personal day is what they discussed with us. That was their, what they felt was fair to them. And I know administration was like, can you do something else besides the lunch at the high school? Because that was also for them to keep track of that was not, they feel was not, or one administrator let us know that that was not, um, it was not very easy to keep track of. Which I agree. That was, I remember with Katie, that was some of the conversations we had with any compensation, whether it was, because we talked about gift cards and we talked about all sorts of different things, but tracking it was one of the major concerns. Who was going to track it and how much time it would take and how we would make sure that it was done correctly. Um, I do agree that they're, they're giving up their time. Um, but definitely the $25 of prep period wouldn't work because our subs don't even get paid $25 an hour to work. <laughs> so that probably right. go over and just not knowing what our budget's going to look like. But mm -hmm. Sharon, I think we could definitely, we'll just have to um, have some conversations and come back to this, but we'll definitely put it on the list to talk about. Yeah, I agree. The, the funding is, is the concern for me currently right now. Um, so I, it's on the list, and, and as Alicia said, I think we'll have to come back to that. Okay. Um, one other thing I wanted to bring up on this is in the elementary grades, teachers prepare, we have focus groups. And during focus group time, our EAs, uh, title EAs come in and they work. We break up our students 
into groups, smaller groups, so that we can meet their needs better. And we have the EAs come in and they work with each of these in um, with the, the classroom teacher. They work in groups so that we can more effectively um, give them instruction. So what's happening is the EAs are pulled. And again, Alicia, I know we had this conversation about being short on subs in our district. And what's happening is the EAs are being pulled. So then that classroom teacher is absorbing that focus group, which is supposed to be small and intensive instruction for a certain amount of time. And so they're absorbing that. And we want to make sure also, you know, and I understand that, you know, the EAs, what it was actually, you know, best for us to hire EAs or, or the district because they're paid, their pay is less. So it's more bang for our buck with an EA. However, what's happening is the EAs are being pulled to sub when a teacher's gone and that leaves that intensive instruction is gone or, or that classroom teacher has to absorb that. And it's actually impacting our students' achievement and growth. So um, I'm not, you know, what, what they were talking about is also when an EA is pulled and that teacher has to absorb that, that small class or a small group, if, um, you know, there's a compensation for them as well for, um, you know, picking up the slack there when, when our EAs are pulled. That's another conversation and concern that they brought to us. Gwen, what does it look like at the middle school? Can you shed any insight on how often or is it happening, or how the teachers feel at the middle school about this? I don't think it happens as often as the high school, and we don't, you know, there's some sort of that problem at the middle school, but not as much. So whatever we come up with, I think it would be a simpler issue to, to solve at the middle school. I don't see coaches leaving a lot or whatever. I don't know. I'd have to ask and see maybe if it was more of an issue than it is at the high school. I don't think it is, though. Okay. Thanks. So um, we'll just wait then on that um, until... We can bring yeah, that back to the table. Yeah, I think on the district end, for sure, we need to have some discussion. And it might have to wait till we get the money part of it figured out, too. But definitely, we're going to need some more time to look at that on our end. Okay. All righty. Um, that was... And, and, and what we do, and I just want to explain, too, is we send out um, concerns, um, and, and what we've received, you know, what we bring to negotiations are the concerns that we have heard from the teachers. And so I know that was a, a big one um, for teachers. So um, going forward in the agreement here, on page, oh wait, I wanna go, oh yeah, on page 19, Under I, letter I, association league, number one, at the beginning of every school year, the association shall be credited with 11 days to be used by teachers who are members of the association. Such use with pay is to be at the discretion of the association. The association will reimburse the district for the substitute only in the event that one is utilized. If no substitute is required, the association will not be required to reimburse the district. These days shall include leave time that may be taken by the association president to attend the annual delegate assembly convention. At all times possible, the building administrator will be notified no less than five working days prior to the commencement of such leave. 
When this occurs, the association's president will provide a written explanation with regard to the delayed notice and provided that substitutes can be arranged, the professional employee will still be granted with paid, <coughs> excuse me, association leave. No one person except the association's president shall be granted more than four days association leave per school year without approval from the superintendent. And what we would like is right now we are credited with 11 days. Um, we would like to change that and add a day um, to 12 days. Uh, last year, our association, um, it was actually the IEA Delegate Assembly was in um, Coeur d'Alene. And so <clears throat> our MEA members who attended Delegate Assembly, the state um, Delegate Assembly, had to have a day of travel going to and coming from. And um, if it's in, held in Boise, we can travel on the same day and we don't have that. Also uh, in October, the president takes uh, days for the president's meeting and in negotiations, we take time and days uh, for the negotiators to meet. So 11 days has not been enough for us and we've been um, really, um, tight on making sure we stay within that. And it's actually, we actually aren't able to meet as negotiators because we don't have enough days. So um, we would like to add a day. And also we do reimburse the district if a substitute is required. We have to have five days. We have to notify our principal. And um, if there's no sub, then we can't take it. We have to arrange a sub. So Shannon, can you clarify to me, when would you be able to take a day and not have a sub? Or is that never the case? Well, actually there was a delegate assembly in April. There was, um, it was on a Friday. And we didn't have school that day. And it was, it was like, oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> we, didn't have, we don't have to get a substitute. So um, it would be a day um, when school is not in session. Um, or I'm trying to think, um, Glenn and Cheryl, when else? Uh, possibly on uh, those October days. Yes. Yeah. And when you guys go to Coeur d'Alene, how many people is that that usually travel to those conventions? I believe we have around six. And they each are entitled to use days as well? Yes, because they are um, for your local, the, the size of your local, you get a delegate, which is a vote, um, to go to the state convention. And that's where IEA does all of their, um, find our, all of their business. We create um, bills and create legislation so that when we go and to the legislature and we, you know, that's where we are working for the teachers during that legislative session. That is where IEA does all of their business and gets those concerns from teachers to take back to the state legislators and work on behalf of those teachers. So each local has a certain amount of delegates for a vote when we're voting on bills and legislation. So, um, and we also have a region president in our local as well. So we're at like six or seven, um, delegates to go to delegate assembly. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and delegate assembly, um, Alicia, uh, Trustee McConkie, is also um, on a Saturday, but it's also that Friday as well. 
So it's two days. It's on a Friday and a Saturday. So one would be a school day and one is not a school day. Sharon, what are your thoughts? Well, and again, just for clarification, um, it's, it's only utilized if you can find a sub and you and then the MEA reimburses the district for the sub, correct? Correct, that is correct. So it, it doesn't cost the district anything um, for, for these days to, because they are reimbursed. I would probably be okay with adding it only one day to make it 12. Alicia? Um, as long as the, my biggest concern is that we have such a hard time finding a sub, but when you said if yeah. they can't find a sub, they can't go. So as long as the responsibility that is on you guys to find the sub, then I'm fine with adding that 12 days. Now, what happens if the sub calls in the morning of? Has that happened before? Do you know what I'm asking? <laughs> oh, are you asking? Are you asking me, Shannon? Yeah, yeah. I'm just curious. Like, oh, I guess those are just details we'd have to work out. Um, as long as we know that there is a sub available, and there's no cost to the district because you're reimbursing us, then I would be okay right. with with the 12 days. And it does say on here. Um, it is it written in the language and provided that substitutes can be arranged. Yep. And we've always arranged actually way in advance because we know what those dates are way in advance. So we, we know way in advance. Okay. So are we all agreeing on that for the 12 days? I'm fine with that, Sharon. If you, we just, I think we just need to um, just double check on our end, make sure there's no financial impact. But I think other than that, where it sounds like everything's covered, I think I would be okay with that. Yeah, I'm with Alicia. So we can, we can check on the financial impact on our end too, just to double check that. So, okay. And, um, and we don't have delegate assembly. Um, I mean, generally we have it in Boise, but there are times when, like last year it was in Coeur d'Alene, so we have that travel time. And that just um, was really hard. Um, and we we could really use, yeah, that extra day, especially in that situation. So, all right. How often is it not, how often is delegate assembly not in Boise? Well, I've had... Um, I know last year they, they like it to have it up in Northern Idaho, but it's not very often because it also costs more money for IEA to have it, you know, for that travel up there when IEA is down here. So it's not often, um, but it does occur. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, oh, on page 23 of 28, how are we doing on time? How is everybody? Uh, it's 11. We're, we're doing okay. I'm doing okay. I'm good. I'm good. I'm fine. All right, um, so on page 23 of 28, letter Q, mentor teacher. Idaho code 33-512 requires boards of trustees to provide support for teachers in their first two years in the profession in the areas of administrative and supervisory support. 
mentoring, peer assistance, and professional development. The Middleton School District and the Middleton Education Association recognize that mentoring can significantly enhance the quality of instruction, optimize student performance, and assist in the introduction, training, and development of new employees, improve the performance of teachers having difficulty in their professional duties, and contribute to the professional development and careers of education. The district and the association shall jointly maintain a mentor program through a collaborative partnership of the program. What I would like to add um, to this is the MEA president shall be included to participate in program meetings and information. Can you be a little more specific or give a little more background as to are they currently not included or what? Like, can you uh, shed a little more light on that? Sure. Um, well, our mentor program um, is ran by Katie Anzalone and Kristen Williams. And we just want to make sure, I know it's a great program and those ladies are both fabulous and do a great job. We just um, wanted to make sure that that the president was also included in, in that, um, in their meetings and conversations, especially since we um, jointly maintain the mentor program. So um, we just wanted to add this language just to make sure that conversations also happen within um, the MEA and so and I know that the district meets with uh, with Katie and Kristen but we also wanted to include the president in those conversations as well well and I can double check on this but it's my I thought that uh, she was included in conversations because I know that they they've met in the district office a couple times this year at least Okay, yeah, and that's great. We just wanted to include it into the language. That's all. And I mean, forward, moving forward. Okay, I, and I'm, I'm okay with that because I, I honestly believe it's already happening. Okay. Okay, we just, yeah, wanted to include that in, in that language there. Um, okay, moving to, um, uh, age 26, underneath a certificated employee workday, non-administrative, letter A. I'll wait till you guys get there. And I'll just read under workday length, the length of the workday shall be seven hours and 45 minutes for a full-time certificated employee. This shall include a minimum of 250 duty free minutes a week for preparation time based on a five day work week and a minimum of 30 minutes duty-free lunch, which excludes any meeting each contract day. Duty-free is defined as no direct teacher responsibility for supervision of a student or students. Arrival time shall generally be 15 minutes before classes begin or as otherwise directed by the respective building principal. What we would like to add is um, to clarify more um, where it says minimum of 250 duty free minutes a week for preparation time. In parentheses, it says based on a five day work week. What we would like to add is based on a full and insert the word full based on a full five-day work week, Monday through Friday. 
And um, this is just so, um, this is just more specific language to what a work week is, what we consider a work week. We consider a work week a full week, Monday through Friday, as um, that's what we consider a full work week. And we just wanted to define this more specifically. So I guess my question is if you want it specific. So if we say a full, a full day or a full week, what did you say you wanted it? A full day or a full week? Uh, based on a full five day work week, Monday through Friday. So does that then not apply for those weeks that we have holidays? So you just have a Tuesday through Friday or the early out Wednesdays? Well, okay, so explain to me. I'm looking like loopholes. Like explain to me what this is. Okay. 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 So like, let's say we start school on a Wednesday, right? So we are working Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, in this contract, according to this contract, um, it's saying that you, that the teacher should receive 250 duty-free minutes a week for preparation it's time. Work week. Which that wouldn't be a five-day work week. That would be a three-day work week. Right. But five days could also mean three days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Monday, Tuesday. So you're trying to get definition as to what a week is, like a Monday through Friday? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So they can't carry over like a Wednesday to a Wednesday? Right. And actually, Alicia, that's what's going on. <laughs> So what do they do? Okay. So we're just trying to define what a work week is. Exactly. Okay. So I, I guess, yeah, further clarification. So we get, if we're in school five days, they get 50 minutes basically each day, plus their 30 minute duty free lunch. Correct? Right. Okay. But if we, are only there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday because Monday is a holiday. I mean, they're still getting their 50 minutes per day, right? Or what are you saying? That well, no, what we're saying is, is there are some weeks we do not receive 250 minutes of prep time because it's a short week or because um, maybe... Um, like I'm trying to think of these instances where, um, like maybe there was an assembly that day. Um, so, um, it, it, um, they weren't in their classes, but what it is, is it's basically <clears throat> just saying that we will get our 250 duty three minutes a week only if it's a full week. Monday through so Friday. Your, but you still get the 50 minutes each day, even if we're only there three days or four days. It, would it be easier instead of defining the week if we just said 50 minutes per day? So there's not confusion or does that make it more confusing? Um, well, maybe, maybe that would be. Maybe we need to talk about that. That may work, but we might want to talk about that one. Right. Right. So let's, um, Put that down and we'll discuss that um, because that might actually take care of it.
So, okay, why don't we um, table that and we'll we'll come back to that. <clears throat> and then, um, if we um, oh underneath that same workday length, I didn't know where else to put this, but um, this is the only area that I saw where this might fit. If you guys see somewhere else that this might fit better, um, let me know. It's the, this would be the language um, because we are having um, staff have, um, you know, told us about concerning, they were concerned that they are required to read emails and, re and or respond outside of contract hours. And since this is work day length, I don't know, you know, if this would fit in here, but um, my language that I have is staff will not be required to read or respond, read or respond to emails outside of contract hours. I don't, I see where you're going. Like, you know, they shouldn't be required to work, but I don't know if I feel comfortable putting that black and white in the agreement because there are times when, like, when we have issues that just hit the fan and we've got to get information out and we need them to check their emails and be on top as we prepare going into different situations. And I don't, I would hate to violate the master agreement because we were requiring them to check their emails on a weekend to prepare. Does that make sense? Like for the situation we're in now, I just don't know how yeah. comfortable I am putting that in the master agreement. I get what you're saying and we should be respectful of everyone's time. I just don't know if I agree with putting it in writing in the agreement because there's so many different circumstances that could alter that statement. Yeah, and I would have to second what Alicia said. Um, okay, and I think, um, you know, I don't have the specifics on this of what, um, you know, is happening exactly. I just know that this is happening. Um, and I just, I, I know that, like, if teachers were out of town on a weekend, um, we just... Um, want to make sure that we're not required to be responsible for replying or, you know, reading emails. And I don't know. Is that something you know, we could maybe address with procedures in buildings instead of through the master agreement on a more specific level? Like, would that be... A, a consideration for you guys if we just do it procedurally in buildings instead of through the master agreement? So through like, um, okay, so instead well, of having like, it, so like policy and procedure, right? Like there's some things mm -hmm. you want in policy because it's the law and that's how it's governed, but there's other things that are procedure. So each building, their administrators would sit down with their principals and outline and they would work with their teachers to say these are the expectations this is the procedure if you're on vacation you're not required you know you can do it when you get back on this many hours after you've returned from your vacation start of a business day does that make sense so we go through the principals and their buildings instead of the district and the master negotiated agreement okay so is it a written i don't know what administrators have is it a written procedural um, document that they receive or just it would be in a handbook or yeah the, my first inclination is is a handbook to where procedures are outlined for the building um, one of the principals said you have to read your email outside hours. That wouldn't be correct either. Well, we would. Especially we would if you're on vacation. With, or, yeah. I, or I from think me, like I'm farming, 
I can't read my emails if I'm driving or something. Well, yeah, I, I guess if you can get some clarification on where that's happening, I mean, is it across every building or is it, is there a particular incident or something that led to this? I, I would need more information on that. Um, but again, I'm with Alicia. I don't feel comfortable putting it in the master agreement because there are times when um, this spring has been a great example that please read your email because there's a major change happening, right? Um, but we could work through things. From from, from from what I've heard, it, and I don't know which building I've heard it, that the principal has gotten upset at somebody for not reading an email when it was sent out. Uh, beyond contract hours, so I don't, I don't think I'm against um, reading emails outside of contract hour, but it's it's a matter of being responsible if if you can't do it. I mean, that's kind of yeah. hard to say somebody responsible for it. I think well, we could work directly with the administrators to identify when teachers would need to check email, and they could be alerted other ways that they need to check email too. But go ahead, Alicia. Sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead and finish. So I think we're on the same. Th that's page. all I was going to say. Yeah, I was going to say it sounds, if it was a specific, more specific incident, that maybe it needs to be addressed specifically and not district-wide, but I feel like it needs to be handled more procedurally and specifically, then I don't think it needs to be put in the master agreement right now. Okay. Um. So we will um, just have that in our notes and um, make sure that uh, then then we'll we'll look for that for on your end, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and then, okay, on page 27, on parent-teacher conferences, letter C, school principals shall set parent-teacher conferences that could extend the certificated employee's professional workday beyond seven hours and 45 minutes. Required time worked beyond the professional workday will be credited to the certificated employee on an hourly basis to be compensated in blocks equal to one half or one full professional workday. Okay, here we would like to add this language. Conference times and schedules shall be consistent among grade level schools and adhere to district calendar and district set time. And let me explain. Um, what's happening is in the elementary level, we're doing conferences at different times. And we would just like it to be consistent among all three elementaries. So like the district, like this purple sage was doing them at a different time than Mill Creek, is that? I guess well, I, don't, I, just, I don't quite understand what. Okay. Yeah, I just, um, we had just received some feedback that they would like, like our elementary, conferences all be held at the same time, which the district sets that up and says, I, uh, conferences are from this time to this time. So I'm not sure what was going on or what was happening, but we just want to make sure that we're, all three elementaries are holding conferences at the same time. And the district is the one who sets up the time. So this is basically just saying that all the schools where will adhere to the times set forth by the district. Shani, could you read the wording one more time just so I make sure I have it correct in the notes? Okay. Um, 
Conference times and schedules shall be consistent among grade level schools and adhere to district calendar and district set or time set time set time. Thank you. Uh -huh. So as long as, I mean, if the district sets time from noon to seven, if one school wants to start at two and one start, wants to start at noon, it doesn't matter because it's all still within the district time allotted, correct? That would be true, yes. But is that what the problem is? Like that well, they're not all starting at noon or that they're not all starting I'm just at the same time. time. Right. You're right. You're right. Um, because I'm the it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's still within what the district set. So is that really going to solve the problem or are still people upset because they don't all start at two o'clock or don't all start at one o'clock? Can I jump in really quick? Yeah. Sure. So the way I heard it when we were talking about the feedback we had from teachers, it would be like if the district said conferences are 3.30 to 7 on Wednesday, that there was a building where they were being told they had to go from 3, start, they were starting like 30 minutes sooner than everyone else. So they were still doing what the district had required, but they had additional time that they were also doing. Shannon, was that your understanding? Right. I, I, that thought that, I thought that time frame was optional, that teachers had asked if they could start earlier. So maybe we need more clarification because that, that was my understanding this, this year. Well, it wasn't necessarily that they were starting earlier because they weren't getting finished earlier. That was the catch. So like one building's going from 3.30 to 7 and another building's going from 3 to 7. So one building's being asked to do more than the other building. Does that make sense? Well, well it wasn't that they were hard yeah, that, that earlier. That makes sense. But again, I thought because I I had someone call and ask me this, and I thought it was because the teachers wanted to start at three versus three thirty, not that the principal said they had to. Well, and there are instances like um, you know when my boys were at the high school or at the middle school where I wanted to go to their conference. So I would ask permission from my administrator. Can I, you know, bump up my time um, to, to be able to go to my boys' conferences? And they were always accommodating. Yes, absolutely. So I don't think this is just a one-on-one, -on -one, like where you talk to your administrator. I think this is, um, more administrators saying you need to start your conferences here and there at this time. Um, and, and I believe that it was brought up that um, that Wednesday of conferences, that was our early out Wednesday. And um, so Purple Sage, we had time to prepare for our, our conferences during that teacher time. So we, were, we got to prepare for for parents, whereas a different school um, did not have time to prepare for conferences. They had to go right as, you know, or quickly after the students left. Ron, is our um, next year's district calendar on the district website already? Yes, it is. I can't remember what parent-teacher conferences look like. So I know we're just doing them in the fall, and I can't remember if they landed on a Wednesday again or what they – yeah, let me see okay. what the dates were. Um, oh, oh, there it is. Um, let me – got to pop it bigger here. That's okay. Where did you find it up? Um, if you go to the front page and scroll down a little bit, it says – Okay, that did not. Oh, there it comes. Okay. Um, 
I'll have to make it bigger so I can see it. Um, yeah, we've said on the 21st of October, parent-teacher conferences are from 3.30 until 7 p.m. And then on the 22nd, they are from to a 1 p.m. dismissal and parent-teacher conferences are from 2 to 7. Right, so that Wednesday that we start at 3.30, um, we, we would like to start at 3.30 unless there's, you know, a circumstance with one individual teacher that they can speak to their administrator. We'd like to adhere to those times. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the elementary schools have more students than others by a couple hundred. Are they able mm -hmm. to accommodate all their kids and parents in the same amount of time as the other elementary schools? Well, when I taught fourth grade and I had 36 students in my class, which now I'm a PE teacher because of that. <laughs> exact same thing um it was alicia it was a nightmare for me to get all, all of them done but by golly i was back to back to back to back to back and i did get them done 36 i did but it was back to back uh, not necessarily per student but i'm saying like one of the elementaries is pushing 700 kids and they're trying to do all those parent teacher conferences in the same amount of time that everyone else is doing 500 ish, give or take. So I'm asking, I just don't, I don't know, Sharon, what are your thoughts? Well, again, I, I know that our office had some calls about this earlier this year, and it was my understanding that it was all optional if teachers wanted to start before the 3.30 time frame. Um, and I do hesitate because if you're going back to back from 3.30, you know, till 7, it, it, it is difficult. Um, well, and that would be great if it's optional for the teacher, as long as it's not the whole school has to do it. Right. And that's, that's what I thought, that it was all optional. So maybe that's where the clarification, do you feel like it's something that needs to be put in the master agreement or do you think that's something that needs to be clarified to administrators and teachers prior to like when school starts as we set up parent teacher conferences? Me personally would think not in the agreement because I like the way that it's written now because we do set the time and then we can clarify with the principals that if teachers want to start earlier, that it's, they're more than welcome, but but the times are set to start at 3.30, and it, it would be up to teachers themselves if they wanted to do it earlier. And could that be clarified in writing so that all the teachers could reference and administrators could reference the same email or letter, or however we want to send it out, so that it's consistent? Yeah, I think we could do that through writing. What are your thoughts on that, Shannon? And Glenn, that would work. That would work as long as it's in writing somewhere. So yeah, Cheryl, I think Glenn, that like the previous one that we said procedurally too. So, so just to clarify, you just don't want to change the language in the contract, but there would be language shared with everyone. Yes. Yeah, we can work on on that procedurally. Yeah, that sounds good to me. I don't have a problem with that. Okay. Um, we've addressed that, so... Um, let me see what else I have. Um, oh, let's see. 
I got everything for actually, what time is it? 11.34. Actually, for today, that is all I have at this time. Awesome. We do have one that I would like to bring up, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, on page, oh, let's see. It would probably go on page 10, <clears throat> uh, number seven, compensation on the extra, extracurricular pay and specials. We would like you to consider adding some wording to allow for volunteer coaches without pay. On page, hold on, page 10. Okay, number seven. I just got there. Somehow where it's added in. This is just a section where it talks about compensation on the extracurricular pay and specials. And we would just like to add wording somewhere. Um, I don't know exactly where that's the best spot, but that's where it talks about coaching specifically. Um, that if we, that we could allow a volunteer coach without pay. Um, okay, I'm gonna write this down. Okay. And um, the only thing um, that I can see is, um, doctor, um, so have you checked on Idaho Code with that, Trustee McConkie? Just, I know Idaho Code talks about coaches and pay. You're on. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I can double, I will double check on, on state code. Okay. Um, can we go ahead and um, table this as well so that we can meet as a team to go over this and um, just make sure we read everything diligently and um, yeah. follow up with code? For sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Anything else? Nope, that was all I had, Sharon. I don't know if you had anything else. Yeah, I don't have anything right now. Glenn, Keithley? I don't have anything else. I don't have anything else. Okay. So going Do, forward. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Shannon. Well, I was just going to say, moving forward, also, we need to set a, another time to finish this stuff before financials or bring this all back when we do financials. What's your preference? I would rather do this before financials, personally. Anybody else? I think anything we can do before financials just saves us time later. I agree with that. Yeah, I agree too. So, uh, Sharon, you probably have the most, the busiest schedule as far as conference calls and stuff. What does your calendar look like? Or, uh, Shannon, how much time do you guys think you need? And how far, yeah, how far out do we want to look? Um, I have, yeah, next week would be fine. Dr. Rebear, do you have anything next week? Um, I do have a few things, but we could probably do Tuesday at 10 again. Um, I would have to be later that day. Later that day? Okay. I, I could do like afternoon um, would be better on that Tuesday for me. 
Okay. Typically, the conference calls with the State Department come on Wednesday afternoon, so I should be or on early, like or earlier if we could be done by like ten thirty, like start eight to ten thirty or something too early. We could do that. You want to just do that? Eight to ten thirty. Eight to ten thirty. Okay. That works. Yeah, that's better for me. I'd rather have the eight to ten or ten thirty. Yeah, hopefully eight. we can get done by ten, but eight to ten thirty on Tuesday the twenty eighth. Great. Good. All right. Thank you very much, Trustee McConkey and Dr. Reberry. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We greatly appreciate your time. And I know you guys are very busy people. So thank you so very much for your time. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Uh-huh. Okay. Bye-bye.